Thank you for joining. I appreciate uh, Andrew and Vern joining today. Today is going to be another exciting um, roundtable discussion, specifically on um, open AA adoption. For COE leaders, it's been a big challenge. Where do we begin? How do we begin? And how do we make sure that it is done right securely? The, the, that is the most important part. So today I have uh, two great thought leaders, Vern um, Keenan is the senior analyst, Andrew Rousseau is an enterprise architect from Baker Systems. My name is Vela Talani. I'll introduce myself. Um, I am a COE lead. At the same time, I'm passionate about educating the COE leaders about uh, the opportunities and opportunity to organize, build, execute the COE, specifically in the Salesforce community. Now I want to welcome Vern. Uh, could you please introduce yourself? Sure, my name is Vernon Keenan. I'm a senior industry analyst who writes at salesforcedevops.net and runs a consultancy called Keenan Vision. And I have been in the Salesforce ecosystem from the very beginning since 1999 as a, a, an observer and a user. And I've had, I've been an analyst uh, since then, since the early days, I had the honor of predicting uh, the rise of big internet giants like eBay and Amazon. And since then I've operated my own companies using Salesforce to run them and Lately, I have uh, been running my website, salesforcedevops.net, where you can find information about that. And my interest in software engineering drove me into the arms of AI recently. So that's what I've been focusing on, you know, with a focus on software engineering and systems. Um, thank you, Vern. Andrew? Hi, um, I'm Andrew. So I've been in the Salesforce ecosystem for going on uh, through at seven, going up to eight years. Um, started out as an admin, and then I've now moved into architecture at Baca Systems. And we are a Salesforce customer who does industrial robotics, and I'm responsible for our entire Salesforce org, as well as I've also started venturing out into doing some different ISV things as a Salesforce partner. So it's kind of a dual role as a partner and customer. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate it. Thank you, Warren. Let's get started. So again, uh, today, um, we will quickly go through the agenda, what we are going to be talking about. Introduction to the, the open, open AI space. And then when it comes to using open AI, specifically in the two friends, we are going to talk about two personas and users and then practitioners. When I say practitioners, we are talking about the development community, primarily architects, ITPMs, the product managers, develop uh, the QA people, BAs, architects, and so on and so forth. So how do we use that um, for these two personas? And then we have Andrew, who has been experimenting with OpenAI or hopefully is implementing it multiple places. So we will have his insights on the, um, as an architect, what does he see the industry doing? Where are we going with uh, the OpenAI, specifically in the Salesforce area? And then next one is the practical approach. You know, I, I, I will share my thoughts on how do companies think about implementing OpenAI for their environment? Finally, we'll keep it for Q&A. So it's going to be for another 50 minutes. Um, thank you again for joining. So introduction. So I don't think I will do a good job of explaining the complete ecosystem. I will turn it over to Vern, who has been fas uh, passionate about talking about this topic not only talking about it, doing it, and implementing it. One, would you like to help us understand where we are? Sure, sure. I think it is not an exaggeration to compare the uh, advent of generative AI as, as to compare it in the annals of computer history to things like the PC, to things like uh, 
you know, introduction of network computers and other, uh, what else we got? We got, you know, the internet, uh, we have uh, uh, SaaS products, we have cloud computing, and we have uh, uh, mobile computing. So you think about all those things I mentioned, and each one of those were transformational. And one way to think about them is to consider the killer apps and the platforms that these uh, that that were pushed in each one of these revolutions. So let's get specific. So there was back in the Apple II days that got pushed into business because of VisiCalc, the software program. So VisiCalc was the killer app and Apple II was the platform. Then I, I, we have Lotus Notes as the killer app and IBM PC Networks as the platform. And then we have NCSA Mosaic as the killer app, and we have the internet as, uh -huh. as the platform, and so forth. And now we have the killer app is ChatGPT. And the reason why I say that is because of its widespread adoption and some of the strange, unique characteristics that it seems, seems to possess. So in this case, for leaders, I think the thing to know is that you've got a killer app here called ChatGPT, and that vendor is OpenAI, and what they're doing is they're putting all that together. And underneath that, though, is the underlying platform for which there will be new applications written, new ships sailed, and you know the new enterprises built upon is the new platform, which is large language models. So we've got ChatGPT as the killer app. It's it's putting it's pulling large language models in to help revolutionize work. And I could talk about the way that it's going to revolutionize work, but uh, I won't drone on about that, uh, except to mention that the gains in productivity and the gains in operational efficiency are definitely real. So again, for the uh, IT leader, COE leader, CIO, you can th start to think about generative AI as a way to apply uh, operational efficiencies in ways you never thought of. You can apply them directly at the point of activity in things like call centers, in things like uh, uh, you know other point of sale or even retail operations. You can have it uh, generative AI assist efficiencies in field service operations and other types of, of activities. I can go on and on about all the, all the potentials. So it's not hype, it's not crypto, it's real. It is a major okay. platform change. To ignore it totally is kind of, um, you're risking uh, like how you would, if what would be happening if you ignored the internet in 1997. Or 1998, it'd be the same uh, level of of risk. So I'm not right. saying that, that you know. And what do IT leaders do about this giant question with very complex answers to it? And it, it comes down to your risk tolerance. Obviously, uh, it seems unwise to uh, to just shut it off. But on the other hand, shadow GPT is a, is a giant problem. This is something that is here now and it's probably going to be worse than shadow IT. Mm -hmm. And just as a reminder, when I were referring to shadow IT, this is when people use their credit card to bring in systems like Salesforce and other uh, software as a service technologies that, that made their job easier. So, but then that became a nightmare for IT later because they had to corral these uh, shadow IT uh, projects and bring them in so that they were, uh, you know, either managed properly, especially if you had a compliance issue in your in your particular industry. So shadow GPT is already here and it's, it's worse than ever. I think that uh, you can probably if you're shutting it off from a corporate firewall so people can't access the domains, they're definitely doing it with their phones. I mean, you, you hear, I think if a software engineer is out there and they hear the stories of, and it's not stories, it's scientific studies that, that put some of these efficiency gains up at 30%, um, then I think, you know, people want to use these tools and there's a lot of pressure 
uh, coming in all the time to, to, to try to use these tools. So um, I, I have some advice here for this for leaders on the subject. And I think one thing to be aware of is that there is no um, security framework that you can look to currently to help you judge what the risks are in using one of these large language models. So if you choose to use uh, an, a, an, an API service like OpenAI, or you're using Azure Cognitive Services, or you're using uh, GCP uh, Vertex AI, or AWS SageMaker, if you're using any of these products, you are using a cloud service that's, that's you know, using your data and doing stuff with it. So, and it's complicated. Um, so I think everybody needs to kind of step back a little bit and make sure you've got a framework that helps you understand what the risks are so that you can understand, you know, is, is a service provider, you know, what are, are they doing SOC 2? Are they doing uh, an ISO type uh, a data security regimen? Um, are, what is their policy and promises in terms of training? Uh, there's a lot of questions and I think everybody need, needs to make their own checklist. Thank, thanks, Warren. One point, as you see the, so you said about 30% um, product efficiency gain. So question is, is the risk versus the reward? Is the risk worth the reward? A lot of companies are investing a lot of time and money and energy in your experience as analyst, do you see that there is going to be a huge benefit compared to the risk? And we will talk about how to mitigate the risk. That's part of the, the presentation today. Mm -hmm. Just if you were to give your um, 30 seconds on the risk versus reward. Sure, I think the, the main thing would be to uh... I think the risk reward is manageable if you have a lot of human in the loop activities right now. Gotcha. So I think if it's acting as a co-pilot or um, like as a software engineer would do it, or maybe as in like we're going to show in the demo, it's basically information that has to be processed through a human uh, before it's useful. Um, then I think it's okay. If you have customer facing stuff, then I think there are a lot of concerns that need to be addressed explicitly. Perfect. So Andrew, I just have a, a one question. What's your gut reaction? Is uh, AI, OpenAI, is here for real or is it a hype from your perspective? I think it's here for real. It's, yeah. yeah, I think I think it's here for real. I mean, Salesforce itself as a company is using OpenAI as their LLM initially for all of what they're doing. So sales GPT is using Open. AI, you've got service GPTs using open AI. So open AI is here from the standpoint of how fast they're going to get into the hands from an enterprise standpoint, it's going to be months to years for enterprise to actually implement in a real way that they're officially giving it. But in every organization, there are people using chat GPT, like what Vern was saying, it's yeah. here and it's going to happen. And it's really important that at companies are ready for it. The hype is there, there's a lot of hype, but it's also an actual thing that's going to drive value. It's a matter of kind of going through the clouds and getting to what's real. Gotcha, thank you. So let's, uh, today I'm gonna to talk about the importance of the COE um, as, a, as a COE person for several years. Um, it, the importance of the COE um, now than ever, um, now the productivity gain or efficiency gain is going to produce a lot of tech debt, in my opinion, a lot of junk into the Salesforce org. So the more you are organized, more you are clear about what you are putting into your org, it is very important. The COE leaders should take the responsibility to define the whole process so that you can reduce the, you can mitigate the risk of increasing the tech debt. So that's my um, biggest uh, finding that I've been talking to people. And now let's also talk about where do we begin. So today we are going to talk specifically about two personas, end users and practitioner. So let's start with end user uh, persona. Um, so 
we do, um, as Andrew said, Salesforce has already released uh, a product that can be used for sales, service, and marketing. I am not sure everything is generally available. And we also have a third party apps. So Vern, would you help us understand a little bit deeper into these two areas? Oh, sure. Um, there is um, on Salesforce's website, I would be Googling for the, the Salesforce Einstein readiness guide. And that is um, a very long, very detailed PDF document that gives you all of the Einstein and uh, uh, GPT products that are that are on the market. So I think we've heard a lot of branding and a lot of, you know, as usual, I think there's confusion in the Salesforce branding space, you know, what they're calling various things. But there is um, in everything seems to be coalescing under the Einstein brand generally. So mm -hmm. all of their existing machine le machine learning products and other services like that are kind of like being bundled in to some of the generative products as well. But in terms of what's actually available now, it's um, pretty much the, the sales pro product that uh, Andrew worked with is one of the only features currently available. And then there's a, also there's a case summary uh, uh, feature and I believe an email uh, or I'm not totally sure about the service uh, cloud offerings because I haven't seen it yet. But again, I, it's a kind of a trivial prompt engineering application where it takes information on the screen and it's obviously running it through a prompt that it's, it's sending to open AI. And I, that's kind of what the sales email application is right now. The other thing that they have rolled out and is active is uh, Salesforce Einstein Studio, and that is for advanced machine learning and uh, uh, folks who are already building their own lang large language models and know uh, what the following acronyms mean, you know, Amazon SageMaker and Vertex AI and all that stuff. And you're, you're a user of those products currently, and you're developing large language models on that. And you've got data cloud running on your on your Salesforce org. Now you can create um, a real-time connection between data cloud and those cloud services. So that's the extent of everything that's shipping currently. And that does gotcha. involve some infrastructure such as the GPT trust layer and some features like that. What about the third-party apps? Do you think, well, what are the types of apps available mm -hmm. and are they better than Salesforce GPT? It's a tough question. Well, they are definitely better in the fact that they're they offer more diverse and imaginative solutions currently uh, for for what you can get. Um, I think just in terms of current and you know, just as an analyst, I'm sorry to say that I, I don't judge the Salesforce offerings uh, as currently having high value based on what's shipping. However, mm -hmm. I I do say that um, I, it's I'm not. That doesn't bother me that much right now because I think I just, I want to look at Q two for for that to to know of next gotcha. year's. So, Thank but you. I third party apps. I think uh, there are some leaders. It's it's coming in on the DevOps and developer side uh, first. I think um, so. You've got um, um, Elements Cloud is kind of blazing the trail with uh, being able to use. Um, the metadata as grounding information for advanced prompts and user story generation and maintenance activities. And Metazoa is doing kind of the same thing, um, except more even admin oriented in terms of like one thing I saw just demoed from them, Metazoa is a flow documenter. Mm -hmm. So it'll read a flow and write an English uh, um, document about what the flow cool. does. That sounds useful. And uh, there's another company out there called iDialogue, D-I-L-O-G-U-E uh, is, the, is the end of the iDialogue with the U-E in the end. And uh, they have uh, actually two pretty cool things. One is a document summarizer. So it'll take any PDF you, you upload to it and it will run um, you know summarization prompt on it and give you a summary. And the other thing that's really kind of stupendous almost if it 
this works is that you can create a, a flow in the background that does multiple machine learning things in a chain. So you could like have multiple callouts to different LLMs or, you know, to your left up to your imagination in some level. So they, so they, he, it's hard to describe, but it's kind of like um, um, a low code uh, version of Langchain, if that means gotcha. anything. Yeah. Thank you, Warren. So Andrew, um, I, you know, I just want to be very clear um, uh, to the audience, anybody who's watching the video, we are not here to endorse any product. We are just giving an example, like Einstein GPT is a sales uh, from Salesforce and whatever the product names that he specified, those products are an example that are out there. So I personally haven't used it. I don't endorse anybody. And if you want to do something, please use it on at your own discretion. Do research, do the right thing, make sure that what fits for your organization. So Andrew, with respect to um, the race is big in, right? The, uh, the ecosystem is growing their base with the with their capabilities with open AI, Salesforce is competing. Um, to me, that's kind of contradicting, right? It's kind of, okay, who is going to win the race? Or where would this end? What's your prediction? I think the race, ultimately, it's going to be a, a really interesting next year to two because nobody wants to compete directly with Salesforce. So like competing directly with Salesforce is difficult. If you think own backup, which is just an example of it, or any of the backup solutions, Salesforce can back up and deploy their own tool. So it gets really hard for companies to compete when Salesforce tries to do it. Salesforce ended up, I think, pulling that product back for the most part. Um, but it gets like if I was sales and a third party backup company, I'd be scared if Salesforce rolled out a successful product with that because it would be really hard to compete when they're rolling it into their contracts. I think that when it, where it's at today with all of the third party tools, they're going to survive and they're going to have a lot of awesome use cases, but they're gonna give flexibility that Salesforce isn't gonna build. And that's gonna be the key differentiator is where Salesforce is gonna build for what's gonna fit 80% of their total licenses. I don't wanna say companies because they don't really build for the fringe case of the massive, massive, or the really small business always. But yeah. if you look at their 80% of their license SKUs sold, wherever that starts to fit in, they're going to build for what's applicable to the masses. And it's going to take longer to get there. But what they are going to deliver is something that's not going to be buggy. So a lot of the current stuff, sometimes you'll find weird things depending on what's in a field value. Oh, wait, we've got a greater than sign because somebody put brackets around it and now it breaks so whatever because it's a new evolving thing so what salesforce when they deliver it it's going to probably be scaled back whatever it is and they're going to deliver it in a stable way that's going to work because they don't want to introduce variables that they are not able to control just like flow builder if you're going to put development in the hands of admins you're not going to give every single possible thing. You're going to scale it to what's going to work. And it's really hard to get yourself into a corner. No, that's a excellent insights. Thank you for sharing that. So um, now that, you know, as we continue with the end users, you know, we talked about, you know, Salesforce, um, as Andrew said, um, it's a, they are coming up with their own products. There are third-party apps. Let's talk about the benefits. The end users, when they embrace or when they look at these products, what benefits do we get? And I, I this information is given by Vern, so I'm not the right person to speak to it. Vern, would you mind explaining to us what are the benefits of using OpenAI for or any large language model mm -hmm. uh, for the benefit of end users? Yeah, so this is my um, analysis of just, you know, what is it good for, <laughs> essentially. Um, I, I was kind of going over it a little bit uh, earlier, but I think I can just kind of hit these topics quickly. Um, I think, again, I mentioned it earlier, productivity is one of the most obvious benefits in terms of reducing tedious work. Um, we're going to, uh, like, for generating content, generating letters, I think the uh, sales email thing is a good example of that. Um, 
Superior customer experiences uh, doesn't have to be uh, chatbots, but it will be chatbots. It will be co direct customer interactions at some point. Uh, but it could just start off with, um, you know, with content generation, with uh, being, um, you know, an assistant or a co-pilot with a with a customer service representative. It could be other ways to uh, synthesize and analyze and bring together information at the point where just right where it's needed. That's the real challenge right. in designing any kind of information like this. And I think one of the more exciting long term opportunities are uh, opportunities is to create what I call the executive thinking partner. So uh, this is kind of like a little bit of sci fi where you would imagine um, as a senior exec in your company having access to all kinds of information in your business and then being able to have a conversation with an AI about that. So this is the the killer app experience of like chat GPT, but it knows everything about your business. So imagine that if you're a senior executive and that's all set up securely and and all that. That's why I say that's in the future. We don't know how to build that quite yet. And I think you can uh, you, you can figure out ways to make money directly or you can use it to improve your sales is certainly one way to uh, improve your bottom line with this. Another thing that people uh, get into is that if you're saving uh, if you're saving efficiencies in these line functions, such as a call center or other places, does that translate into lower uh, operating expenses? Can you, you know, can I uh, focus on that as, a, as an outcome? And I think the answer is yes. Um, and then finally, it's, it accelerates innovation, I think, in software engineering. Um, I've seen this directly, how it just uh, lets you move quicker through um, a design analysis. I think you could, uh, in any other part of a, an enterprise, especially any kind of design function, any kind of creative function, it's going to be able to accelerate. Great. So actually, um, it's a you you put it nicely here on this slide. But I do want to uh, emphasize here: there is a lot of excitement. You know that's uh, that the one persona is the end user. You know we can pr we can make this happen without not without with the minimal or limited engagement from the development community. You know, there is, it's easier to implement, but the most important lesson that I'm learning from other folks, including my own research and the POC, without the practitioners, this is not going to be possible for long-term. When I say long-term, it's like a coin with two sides. If the end users need to be successful to see the outcome, like a growth, customer service satisfaction, you need to educate the practitioners the right way. So that is the next topic that we are going to talk about. So these are the practitioners that need to also learn how to use or how to adapt to the system of the new way of doing things, whether you are an architect, developers, um, BAs, testers, product managers, and so on. So Andrew, uh, I just want to ask you a question and then Vern, I will turn it over to you. Uh, do you see in your experience what the people you are talking to, what is the, the interest level for these folks wanting to get onto this newer, um, revolution in my opinion i think the interest is high and i think there's different groups have different levels of interest that they think that there's going to be a value of the two groups that really are i think the heaviest interest is when you're thinking about the bas who have a really big interest in the requirements gathering documentation side where there's a lot of value because a lot of that is a text when you're talking about generative AI specifically a lot of that's a text generative thing so a lot of the typing and the manual work there it's a good area that a lot of innovation can come into the other side is developers because developers obviously are writing code so there's some value that can be given of helping to create some of the baseline stuff helping to just start starting points really and then they can go and customize it for what they need those are the two groups that I think a lot of the, the excitement is in. End users are 
this whole other group where end users kind of either will go off on their own and use chat GPT as an example, and they just are using it. I found out some of our marketing people just use chat GPT and they even have paid for an account with it because mm -hmm. they figured why not. So you learn the different groups there, like on the creative side, but for the most part on like the internal, like CRM team that's building Salesforce for an org, it's the BAs and I think developers where there's a lot of interest. Great. Well, you have been doing this, uh, the experimenting, you've been passionate about talking it and I've seen some of the things, your postings that you have done with respect to the open AI. I actually put developers two times. It's not a mistake. I want to make sure that I want to emphasize that <laughs> people. And the re reason I put two or twice, to me, what is the future of developers? <laughs> mm. that, well, that's the, I'm asking myself a question with a team that I'm leading and the leaders that are leading COE, what is the de future of developers? Are they going to, are they scared? Are they excited? Uh, what is that we okay. should be worried about? Workforce impacts. Yes. Um, so it's complicated, I think. Um, and I don't really know uh, what uh, to predict on this one. So it's a little, my, my crystal ball is a little uh, foggy. I'll give you the primary factors to make that uh, so. Um, one is that uh, I think that if you're using a system integrator and you have a bunch of contract work going on in your development life cycle and you have the, you know chains of communication happening, I think that should be questioned in, in the light of, of open AI and the ability to maybe shorten that a little bit and have some of your senior people generating code with the, with the AI that might be something to think about. Um, and then so that would uh, have implications on offshore work and other 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 things of that nature. Yeah. But on the other hand, I mean, there's all there's all kinds of other hands on this. I mean, if you are in offshore and you're communicating in English with somebody, now you have a wonderful translator at, at your disposal. When was there ever a time when we had sufficiently automated everything? You know, I think uh, how much of the world can still be automated? I mean, software's been eating the world for the last 10 or 15 years, and I think it hasn't finished. We're like, you know, at second breakfast or something, you know, in terms of that. Uh, and so I think there, there's kind of like infinite work for, especially business process people and other folks who can figure out how to automate things and, you know, understand the capabilities of new systems and can match them uh, with new systems. And, um, the other thing that's happening too is I, I think that this, um, I keep getting back to the uh, paradigm shift thing because I, I kind of always want to remind you about that. And I think it was the uh, uh, Barack Obama's uh, chief of staff, his name was Rahm Emanuel. And he said, never let a crisis go, a good crisis go unused. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, if you've got people who are, who are thinking about, you know, generative AI as a, as a paradigm shift, maybe it's the time to, to do a paradigm shift in your own organization, mm -hmm. you know, so, so it, it could be that, that this might be the opportunity, like if you uh, can provide leadership in your own organization on this subject, this, this might be the kind of thing that would propel you personally and your, your organization to having a, a progressive look at AI. Oh, I, I, I agree hundred percent with you because I'm looking at, you know, the way I look at it, large organizations, uh, when they, it's all about writing a story and the story goes to the production. It takes multiple births, rebirths, births, <laughs> then it goes into the production. Can we imagine? And there a story gets handled by multiple people, multiple touches. So you want to build uh, you want to make a donkey, but you will end up with uh, 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 probably mm -hmm. a cat. Um, so like the game of telephone. Exactly. And it is. So I think, in my opinion, um, there is an opportunity for COE leaders to look at this holistically. What can we do to transform rather than just making some productivity gain? The productivity gain, in my opinion, it's going to create more problems. 
it has to be a, a change from beginning to the end. The way we take the requirement, the way we develop and deliver, and the way the users use the open AI to see the benefit. It has to be that way because mm -hmm. many, many large organizations, even mid-sized organizations, in my experience, it's, you know, it is a systematic software development. I wouldn't say systematic. It's a, they follow somewhat systematic software development, um, whether it's Agile or Waterfall or a combination. I think the, the CEO leaders should consider looking at both sides of the coins. One is the users, the, the practitioners. So mm -hmm. let's move on to the next one. So Vern, first of all, thank you for putting together a demo. How does this work in a, in a real world? So if you're a COE leader, it gives you a glimpse of a prompt engineering, and we will ex he will explain, Vern will explain. Let's do a demo for, you know, I think it's a minute, right? Um, it's about three minutes, yeah. Okay. Again, uh, I just wanted to show you how to use the AI gateway for Salesforce in a zero, shot prompt scenario, one of the most uh, basic situations. So I'm gonna, I'm accessing the app that you can install and I'm gonna go to the prompts. And one of the prompts that comes with it is called market research. So I wanna perform market research on a Salesforce uh, topic. And so I, what I'm doing is I'm buying a Salesforce backup solution here. So I clicked into the prompt I clicked into the parameter field. And so if you see here on the right side of the screen is what the system prompt is gonna be. So uh, I pulled it out here so it's easy to see. And I wrote this one manually. So I just wrote this one from scratch uh, for it to perform market research. I wanted to look for factors of analysis. I wanted to do a table, oops wanted to do a table and then I wanted to uh, list each competitor that I'm looking for. So to do that, all I have to do is, is have a user prompt that goes with that, says create a market analysis for market name. See, I've kind of almost re referring to this thing as like a subroutine called market analysis. And I say, create a market analysis for market name. And then I'm the market name here is going to be Salesforce Backup Solutions. So I'm just going to execute that, and that's going to take a second. And we'll be right back. Here's the good part about okay, the and we're back. And here's the response. And I copied it over here to Markdown Preview, so it's easier to see. And it's um, answered my questions here where it's listing the primary factors of analysis. We tend to agree with these. And then it actually went through and created the table that I asked for. Um, and then it gave me information about each of these. And then decent analysis uh, coming out of GPT-4 here. So, that is an example of how you can use zero shot prompt engineering to give access to a facility like this to execute uh, market research uh, pretty easily just based on entering in the topic. So I didn't have to do any prompting here as a user, I just executed it. So yay for prompt engineering. Thank you. Right. So the, the the idea there is you've got your practitioners carefully crafting those prompts and then distributing them through a platform that users can use. No, first, thank you. So this is a, um, a, a generic example, weren't, right? So this is not necessarily for end user, not necessarily the practitioner. Any well, it was, yeah, I guess you could put, if you could craft the prompt for doing market research in the subject matter of your company. There you go. I, I, it's a, so the power of the platform, the prompt engineering that you explained. For the developers, is this going to be 
similar or is it going to be somewhat complicated? Well, I think the thing, the main thing to think about, and here, here's an innovative thought, it's, and I can be pedantic about it, but um, it's that prompt is like code. So I think that that's a key realization is that um, you've got these prompt engineering platforms and it allows you to treat them more like code so that you can share them and store them and maybe create versions of them have uh, workflows associated with them. Um, and I think it democratizes AI's capabilities. I think this is the key thing that when you have a prompt engineering platform and you craft all these fancy prompts, what you're doing is you're putting parameters inside of them. And this is almost exactly like creating subroutines or, or invocable functions or something like that. Yeah. So you've got parameters inside of prompt code that instead of running on you know on a c compiler or whatever is running on your llm hmm. to to so, to do the processing yeah very very uh, no thank you so it actually um gives me a lot of ideas of how we can use this one um oh, yeah. The question is how easy to build a, a prompt engineering platform as a CEO leader if somebody mm -hmm. comes to me and say, hey, let's build it, start using it, as long as it meets the company's requirement, you know, keep that in mind, right? We cannot uh, violate the company policy. Mm -hmm. So how easy, the one you showed me so, looked simple, uh, but I'm pretty sure you spent quite a bit of time to figure this out. I didn't. I didn't. Did? Okay, so the answer is not <laughs> that difficult. It's not that hard. Okay. Um, that, that is a characteristic, actually, that that is a thing to be aware of, is that creating um, AI embedded applications is not hard, because the APIs are very, very simple. Perfect. So, Andrew, um, you know, you as an architect, you know, you, you, you've been sought after Salesforce uh, community to help solve some problems, give your insights. Um, What's your experience with the PEP, the prompt engineering platform? And uh, how do we build this one for developers? Yeah, so I have not played with um, yet with what Vernon's built on for the open source, the generic um, prompt engineering platform, but I have looked at what other platforms are in terms of that. And also what Salesforce is doing with prompt engineering, which is gonna be called Prompt Studio. Mm. Um, and I think it's going to be, it's what's needed to actually take open AI and what people are doing with just chat and they're just doing their own conversations in there and to make it actual enterprise grade, because the important part is the connecting the data and that and giving, making it easy to use. And if you think about how much effort you spend, like trying to set up like a situation when you're using chat GPT to go like solve it, like I've got this object with this fields, with this information and that write me an apex class that's going to return this and write this 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 to the debug logs oh and also i've got this permission that needs to be the like all the things you have to do to set it up from the if i'm doing it for like a as a drm practitioner or an admin architect developer side we can deliver right to not have to do that because the it has access to the information so we can one time set it up it'll take a little longer and it's good to go to keep doing it and you could move faster on the end user side end users are it's going to that is what's going to make it be able to take business data and give it to a open ai and llm model and get a usable thing back because end users aren't going to copy and paste stuff and actually do do right they're going to put minimal stuff in they're going to get bad results out and it won't be as useful for them so i think the prompt engineering platforms there's going to be a lot of them that'll come out over time and they're going to be the key to making this actually a thing. They're going to be the foundation, really, of all of the different stuff that gets built. Thank you. I appreciate uh, sharing your thoughts on it. So features and additional features. So Vern, certainly this is the information that I got from you. Yeah, I think this, this could be... Understand. I'll try to classify this um, basically. And 
So let's, I think the, to build a prompt engineering platform on your own, uh, to me, if the, if you got a big company and you have some talented programmers, it might be a feasible project. Um, the other thing is the reason why I listed all these things here is for leaders like yourself to be aware of this classification. And when somebody starts to try to sell you something or, or to understand, you know, what they're promising, if it fits into this category mm -hmm. as a prompt engineering platform, I think what I could say to that is it sounds like that vendor's on the right path yeah. and they've got a realistic product that, that's going to be useful. So that's kind of what, why I'm, I, I have that. And I mean, the features are basic. You, you need a, uh, the basic features are the, if you were building one yourself, the minimum viable uh, product features would be, um, you know, you want to have a centralized repository where people can share and the potential for having a community where people can upvote and downvote prompts and do things like that is there as well. I think for COE leaders, I, the opportunity for community outreach always seems like an, an opportunity for, to me to, to improve your marketing and communication. Um, you know, it should be well indexed with a knowledge graph. You need versioning and you need to be able to deploy different versions of the same prompt at the same time because uh, you could have chaining involved where you have dependencies of prompts going on. Um, you want to know exactly what's going on when you're running these prompts, just in number, terms of number of execution, and you probably want to save everything that you're doing with them so you can analyze it later and you know look for anomalies and other problems. And I think parameterization is really, really key. That's these are parameterized objects. That's the way to think about uh, prompts in the enterprises. They're parameterized objects. Um, and they, they're artifacts in your enterprise architecture now. So they need to be uh, tested and validated. And you need a deploy, and you also need a way to deploy them efficiently. And I can go on. I think there's all kinds of additional features that incorporate some additional uh, advanced machine learning and grounding capabilities, which is are interesting. But I think it's actually, and I kind of hate to say this a little bit, even if you got a dirty org, I think that a prompt engineering platform is going to uh, be useful to you in the, in the beginning. Um, it's because some of the applications are limited, like the one I showed. Hmm. No, it's a, an interesting, I mean, I'm, I've been working with Salesforce for 23 years. Um, so now, you know, I've gone through um, a basic five tab classic version all the way to lightning. Today we are talking about something open AI, but this is changing the entire um, ecosystem tremendously. I mean, it can, I'm not saying it is changing, it can, especially mm -hmm. on the, the, so as a leader, COA leader, for me, the compliance, productivity gains, stability of the platform, our strong architecture, quality of data, and so on and so forth, right? But for people who implement Salesforce, do you think this will be useful to reduce the cost? And at the same time, you know, I've seen implementations go for two years, six, year and a half. Uh, to oh. me, it's not a agile. If you if it goes for two years or a year and a half to go live, uh, you please don't implement that. In my uh, opinion, at least more than a year and a half or so, right? You got to mm -hmm. shot. So, wh where do you think this new paradigm shift will play in implementing Salesforce, uh, the brand new implementations? Andrew or me? Uh, any one of you, Andrew or uh, Vern. So let's go with Andrew. Yeah, I think when it comes, like if you're thinking about the, uh, this is going to drive a better practices before in the past, what we haven't have is a strong reason of why to use descriptions to answer the why we've done this, not what it does, because everyone can tell what a field does, but why that it was done, because the hum the the why is the important thing in the past there hasn't been a strong reason other than we should do better documentation we should have good org health but this is going to drive that so that's going to be one part of it is that this will drive the why to do all of these different things that everyone's been saying do that it's important um the other thing is that 
data quality is always going to be an issue. Yes, it's going to impact this and it will be a impactful for orgs, but it's not, that's not going to be the blocker for anybody. No one's going to not use AI stuff because of data quality. It just is going to make their results maybe a little harder to get to or a little more challenging. But over time, data quality does improve for the most part in orgs. Gotcha. So actually, I have implemented um, Salesforce for many, many large clients. I wish I had this feature available. Uh, you <laughs> know, I spent uh, nights and weeks and days and 24 hours a day of making things work. One uh, class, the, the, especially the test coverage and all those things, you just go through the grind, um, stories after stories and the sprint after sprint. Sometimes it's okay, I'm done with it. I have to move on to the next project. I think this will help quite a bit, yeah, especially the mm -hmm. efficiency, um, the productivity, even faster solution, in my opinion, the test cases that you can write faster with the, the open AI. So as a CYE leader, if you're implementing Salesforce for first time, or if you are implementing it for a new division or a new team, I think the open AI will be a good, good, uh, uh, some, yeah, a good platform to consider should use it. All right. So, yes, uh, we, we, we could skip this slide. Basically, uh, I think we're running out of time, but maybe yeah. just to, uh, to reinforce your last point there, Velu, I think if we look at um, prompt engineering, could be this catalyst for uh, looking at value in your organization. So I think that if what you want to do is use prompt engineering operationally, like I mentioned several times, you know, in the pits of your of your organization with with your you know with your operational staff. Then I think when, before you do that, let's step back just a little bit and make sure you understand what the value chains are in your organization and how you can maybe uh, arrive at some KPIs or other uh, uh, you know, management uh, uh, measures on you know, what it is you're trying to make better with AI. And, and then to initiate the whole project with a product-oriented team that looks at those KPIs as you know their reason for being, you know, like the 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 the, the, the I, did you have a permanent group that's that's creating these projects, and you know they're handsomely rewarded perhaps if they're able to you know increase the KPIs they're assigned to increase. I mean that that's that's one idea to maybe break through the the uh, to use AI as that crisis that you don't want to waste. To maybe break through those those barriers. Agreed. And prompt is like anything. It's like a yeah, data that you have to maintain. It's a you, you, the healthier prompts you have, better environment you will have. Thank you. Yeah, and, and this slide just reinforced the whole idea that prompt is code, basically. Perfect. And we need new ways new ways to organize it. Thank you. So Andrew, as an architect, you know what are your insights? What have uh, can you share your insights with us? Yeah, so we're going to keep, go pretty quick through this just because obviously we're right at getting close to time. The key things that I think is really important to think about right now, because there's so, it's a fire hose of stuff, where do you focus your efforts as a COE leader? What makes sense to do? Thinking about Salesforce's roadmap, like I talked to before, they're going to focus on what is going to be widespread that will make sense for a lot of people. Writing a sales email writing a knowledge article based on stuff that was discussed in a case, summarizing case. Summarizing case literally works for anybody who has cases in Salesforce and wants to record a summary of a case. So they're going to build that type of stuff. If you want to start to be on the cutting edge as a CRE leader in your org or in the business, think about what are things that are more unique to your business that will drive value. Those might be a better place to start today than to go do something that's heavily generic that Salesforce will roll out potentially within half a year. And you could get the value in half a year. So in three quarters of a year from now, you could have your heavily customized thing that will be valuable for the business. And what is generic, it'll also be, have value rather than doing what's generic first. And then now you're gonna be farther to do what is cannot custom. So thinking about that is important. The other is the driving business value. 
and looking at what's going to bring value for each business unit and comparing costs of building versus buying. Because it with OpenAI, you're not just buying it one time. And when you're building it, you also are owning now the cost of buying, maintaining it over time. As a Siri leader, you have to develop. When you build it, you own the code and you're stuck maintaining it. Whereas third party, you don't have to maintain it and it's not going to break as often. If it does, it's someone else's fire for you to have fought. So it's just important to keep that in mind. And the last thing is just looking at the tax that companies will add on top of it. If you aren't using your own a open API credentials or your own large like models credentials for it, someone's probably putting a tax on it to access it. Salesforce has Actually. their own credits. Be careful of that. Think about the cost for the business. Perfect. So those are thank the kind you. of high level things. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it. I know we are getting close to the time. So I will take a, while, a minute on this one. Um, as, a, as a practical approach, as a COE leader, where do you do? You got to have a strategy. You got to have what I have seen um, comp, you know, in the Salesforce ecosystem, primarily when you implement Salesforce, yes, we do have a lot of um, executive support. But now uh, the open AI, it affects the entire organization. So executive buy-in is very, very important. Um, you don't have to sell anything because a lot of executives are already looking into it. Even at the board level, people are talking about it. So it shouldn't be that difficult for us to get a buy-in. And the ethical use of open AI, it's very important. Legal, ethical means is very critical. Um, you know, I was told even if you get a, a code that is copyrighted by somebody else and you put it in your code, you could get into potentially a trouble. I don't know in the code of law how easy to prove that. I don't know, but that's somewhere I was reading that. So you got to make sure that you have a legal team completely reviewing what you're doing. Finally, you got to have a governance and oversight. You know, that is very important. So these are the practical approach uh, points that I could think of it. You know, I talked to some of the leaders and this seemed to be the common, um, um, uh, common trend. So now, Question and answer. We have two two minutes. I think there are two questions <laughs> on the um, on the panel here. I have quite a few questions, but I don't think we will have enough time. But first of all, we have um, you know, if you want to reach out to Andrew, please uh, reach out to him through LinkedIn. Um, and he's based out of Michigan. Vern is based out of uh, the Bay Area, the Great uh, Silicon Valley area and certainly is the analyst for Salesforce. Uh, so if you come to Dreamforce, I'm sure you can see him and uh, hopefully Andrew. Um, and uh, let's see, we have two questions. Uh, and, uh, what are the questions here? Um, okay, someone here giving context for person input, um, productivity. Uh, okay, so there is some contact here. This would be, um, so it's on the productivity increase. So I, I want to emphasize again, the productivity increase can be measured only when you feel that you have a good measuring mechanism. You know, it's a, you, you can't just say, roll the dice and say, okay, I got 30% gain or my story only takes 10, uh, it used to take two hours, now it only takes 30 minutes. It has to be an end-to-end a measurement. That's how I look at how you measure the productivity. And if um, Andrew or um, Vern, do you guys know how to measure the productivity so that we can say that, hey, I'm ex investing X amount of dollars, my gain is going to be, the how do we do that? Uh, the only way that I know of, and this is again from my uh, ivory tower perch, so it may be not fair because it's very complicated to do this, but it's essentially to do the full value stream analysis where you, where you have some sort of idea the, the, of the actual flow of value in your organization and that you can measure some of that flow in terms of man hours, dollars, resources, and things like that. And that'll all translate into a KPI that you can measure. Perfect. Andrew, final thoughts on measuring productivity? Yeah, I think that it's important to also not not directly look at productivity as an exact measurement of it because success is not efficiency success is outcomes 
just because you can use chat GPT or open air, any G generative AI to send 25 more emails a day. If your measurement is how many more emails you send, it doesn't matter. It doesn't help at all. If every email doesn't even get opened by it because they're horrible looking emails on the first two preview lines, mm -hmm. measure outcomes. Don't measure that it's implemented measure what you're trying to achieve. You're trying to achieve more sales and more positive interactions. You're not trying to send more emails. So focus on what the business value driver is rather than just efficiency. And I think that's the important part. Great insight. I truly appreciate it. It's uh, two minutes over. First of all, thank you both for joining and thank you others for joining the call. I will um, clean up this uh, record, the video, and post it on YouTube. And um, you know, I'll share with both of you. And I appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.